Hello again and welcome to another day of Daily Bible Study. Uh, we're continuing on with our journey through Paul's first letter to Timothy. Uh, today we're going to be picking up in chapter 3 starting in verse 8. We'll be talking about the qualifications for deacons. Uh, but look forward to it, let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that um, you have you called us to ministry. And Lord, we're not all called to the exact same kind of ministry, and yet we are called uh, to be helpers, to be servants, uh, to be workers. So Lord, help us to be giving ourselves as fully as possible to the ministry you have put into our lives. And Lord, help us to be faithful in whatever situation we find ourselves. Lord, we ask that you be with us during this time. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So yesterday we looked at Paul when he talked about the qualifications for being an overseer, or it could be a superintendent, or it could be a bishop. And um, so today we're looking at what he talks about with deacons. And I want to stray, before we get into the actual text itself, just for some context so you can kind of prime the, the thinking here, is that uh, as a general rule, there has been either two or three kind of offices or um, orders of ministry. And the idea is, you, beyond, beyond being just a lay person, that the first one is would be a deacon, kind of the, what they call the lowest level, to use hierarchical language, which I don't like so much. But, but that's been the tradition, is that the lowest kind of clergy or lowest kind of person who's dedicated to ministry is a deacon. And then the next level is the elder and could also be considered a bishop. And then the third level is being a bishop. And so we talked about what it looked like to be a um, elder. So it's kind of just by way of, by going back to yesterday's thing, talking about there's things like, yo, um, above reproach, husband of one wife, temperate, prudent, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine, not pugnacious, gentle, peaceable, free from the love of money, things like that. So this is today, we're going to look at um, the qualifications of the deacons, and I want to see if you find any similarity between them. So starting in verse 8, this is what we read. Paul writes, deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued or addicted to much wine or fond of sordid gain, but holding, up, uh, holding to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. These men must also first be tested, and then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Uh, deacons must be the husbands of one wife and good managers of their children and their households. For those who have, have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus." So we get a, a word there, just one verse in there kind of about women again, which is kind of interesting. Um, and, and I guess in the context, it makes me think that there probably are definitely, that Paul's envisioning that there are women who are serving as deacons. Uh, and so, you know, maybe he's specifying that specifically, he wants to emphasize that they should be dignis, dignified, not malicious gossips and things like that. Um, but might be worth noting that it seems as though he's talking about uh, women serving as deacons. Now, you could say maybe he's saying things about women generally, but again, it's sandwiched right in the middle of a of handful of uh, uh, qualifications for deacons. So it strikes me as unlikely that all of a sudden he's not talking about women deacons, he's talking about just women in general. So, But one of the things I'm struck by in that list is how very similar it is to the previous list of qualifications. Now, they're not exactly the same. We could hold them up next to each other and find some moments where one thing's emphasized here versus something else. But as a general rule, they're real similar. We talk about monogamy here again. We talk about um, you know, not being addicted to wine. We talk about having a clear conscience. We talk about them being tested. Um, we would talk about being good managers of their children, of households. You know, we're talking about those kinds of things. Now, there are probably a few fewer qualifications for deacons listed than there are for elders, which perhaps is part of why uh, throughout history, you know, elders have been seen, elders, overseers, bishops have been seen as kind of a higher order because there's more expected of them. But I want to tell you something about the fascinating story of the beginning of the el of deacons. Well, before, no, before I do that, I want to tell you about how the United Methodist Church and other churches sometimes deal with it. For some churches... Um, uh, elders are the kind of governing board of the church. They have a board of elders. My understanding is Presbyterian and Reformed churches have um, you know, a session or a consistory, and the idea is that you are elders who are serving in that capacity. There are other churches that talk about uh, you know, almost having have a board of deacons that are functioning as a, a kind of servant ministry, or maybe sometimes deacons bear the kind of similar uh, uh, responsibilities as being like, um, like trustees. But in its original form, I mean, the United Methodist Church, we actually have a very different perspective on deacons. We used to have deacon as being kind of a stepping stone that you're ordained as a deacon before you're ordained as an elder. Now we've changed that, and so you're uh, commissioned as a provisional elder and then ordained as a full elder. But the, the part I want to bring up for you is that in the Bible, there is... Um, oh, sorry, uh, I didn't finish the United Methodist Church thing. So now we have... Um, so elders are ordained to word, service, sacrament, and order, whereas uh, deacons are ordained only to word and service. 
And so what that means is that deacons are primarily uh, those who are uh, working at the intersection of, of the church and the world. Uh, so I have one friend of mine who is a math professor at a community college, and he's also a deacon, you know, working as, as a way to extend the ministry of the church into the secular world. Um, I, I know some of the people who are you know, deacons, and they're working in uh, various health-related fields or mental health-related fields. Um, you know, some work specifically by focusing on Christian education or Christian formation. But in the earliest church, uh, the, we have a story in the book of Acts about the birth of the order of the deacons. And essentially what it was is that there were, they were distributing, the church in Jerusalem was distributing food uh, to the widows in the community. And one of the things that was happening was um, women, you know, uh, widows who were part of the Jerusalem church uh, were be getting priorities. And those who were, had connections, who had moved to Jerusalem, who had a background in what they called the, the, the diaspora or the scattering, uh, were being overlooked. And so they brought this to the apostles, and the apostles said, we have so much to do when it comes to the ministry of the word, uh, we cannot take time out of that to wait tables. But they didn't say then that therefore it shouldn't be done, but they said, we got to find people, appoint people who are faithful and reliable people and have them oversee this. This is very important. So they became deacons, uh, which comes from a, a Greek word meaning uh, servants. So it was really funny. The reason why I bring this up is because in the very beginning, the defining characteristic that would separate the elders and the apostles from the deacons was that the apostles preach and are dedicated to the ministry of the word, and the deacons are not. <laughs> the deacons are concerned with, the, concerned with the mundane things, and they're not primarily preachers. The reason why that's interesting is because very quickly we start finding out that Stephen, who is a deacon, uh, is attracting unwanted attention to himself, and part of it's because he's preaching. And when he is eventually stoned to death, uh, it is in large part due to his preaching ministry, and he is about the act of preaching even in the act of his martyrdom. The reason why I bring this up is because um, this idea of to be the kind of person who is qualified to be a deacon, we get the sense where it's like it's almost, it's really important that you're also qualified to be uh, something beyond that because we see already that uh, from the very beginning, even when we define deacons as those who are not really ministers of the word, they very quickly become ministers of the word. And I, what I appreciate about that is that we see in Stephen specifically and the deacons generally this idea of we are all called to ministry. And as Paul will say in other places, we're called to be able to give an account of the work of God in us. And it might be, it's not how we're spending most of our time, uh, but even if we just say, you know, all I want to do is I want to help deal with, you know, the goings on in the church. I want to, you know, clean the toilets, sweep the floors, do the janitorial work, which is important work. Uh, it is still possible that you may be called upon to bear witness to your faith in Christ and what God has done in your life. So I, I say all that to say, um, there's really no getting out of the ministry of the word. It might look different from person to person. Uh, it might take up more or less of your time depending on who you are and how God has called you. But the fact of the matter is even the deacons who originally were defined as those who were not primarily preachers, even they ended up preaching. Uh, so I say that to say, um, like Paul says, be prepared in season and out of season to give an account for what God has done in your life. And I think that if we can do that, if we always remember, if we can always keep an eye on what our testimony is so we can share it, uh, you know, not without necessarily any nervousness, uh, but without fear, uh, it is a good thing for the church. Well, that's all for today. Come back again tomorrow. We'll continue on with First Timothy. Have a good day.